to round two. We just finished uh, my talk on the night moves. The Let me just show you guys this for those of you who may not have watched the video and uh, the presentation. I recommend doing it or reading the paper. I just went through uh, night moves for all you Bob Seeger fans out there, uh, the lost dance of the Millennial Kingdom, and showing that there was a uh, the scholars all you know admit it, and the historians that there was all across Europe, France, down to Spain, up uh, through England, all through, uh, all the way to the the Balkans and into Germany and so on. There was down into Greece. There was this circular dance uh, called the Caro or the Rondu or a few other names, and um, and not one lyric or tune has survived amongst the thousands that there had to have been over this time period, over many centuries, not one has survived. They've essentially all been scrubbed. So, uh, and we could show you a few pictures of it here. This is of course review for those of you who five minutes ago, were just watching this presentation, but here's some of the artwork here depicting it. You can see very somber over here and a little bit more festive down here in the bottom left corner. When we have a, uh, an actually an, an actual knight in armor dancing with the ladies how fun and then in this one we see an angel dancing with them i go into that i'm not going to describe it all now you guys just need to see it for yourself and then of course here we see many angels dancing with kings and queens and other saints in a paradise environment and my favorite of course of all of them is these these really these two pictures here of the uh, rondu or the carol and these are all angels. And of course, you know, the, the, the idea with medieval art is that if if something is positive in a painting, it's because it's done in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. That was the theme of these paintings. And so um, if they're showing people dancing in this circle on earth, they're surely going to show angels doing it. And we see it right here. These are all feminine angels. Uh, looks like they're dancing around the zodiac, and then we see undeniable here above the nativity scene all uh, angelic women, uh, twelve of them dancing around the birth of Mashiach very joyfully, and they're holding branches in their their hands. And uh, and I talked a little bit about you know evidence of, of female angels, and yeah, I think that's good. So I'm gonna jump back over here. Now we're getting into the mystery of the maypole. And I know this is like, I don't intend to, I know this is probably going to upset someone out there, you know, because, and I also want to be clear that I'm not looking to, I have just, so you guys all know, I have never danced the maypole. I have no desire to dance the maypole. And there's too much about our history that has been scrubbed that we don't know that. Yes, I would feel uncomfortable probably dancing around the maypole. Um, all that being said is that I decided to look more into the maypole because it, it, it was kind of like the, the, the breadcrumb trail, right? I started looking at this circular dance that is completely lost to us. It was done all over the world uh, that we don't even have descriptions of until uh, of this dance until the Renaissance, uh, which it was going away by that point. They were fading it out. Or phasing it out, and then we have the maypole. So let's just get right into this. Nobody really knows where the maypole finds its origins, nor what it all means, though many have tried. Well, isn't that odd? I mean, that its origins are unknown. We don't even have a motive. Nearly everyone stares up at a maypole and then joins in with the common consensus that we're dealing with another pocket rocket ceremony. The typical deduction is that children are being coerced into an oppressive dance honoring pagan deities by the creepy pedo people, but that, but that very well may be wishful thinking. Oh, the maypole is undoubtedly esoteric, fertile with spiritual implications, but it needn't be nefarious or pagan. Now, the, the first maypole I ever saw, I, I grew up, of course, in California, never saw a maypole. Now I'm in the South, never seen a maypole. I hear they have some here. Uh, but I, apparently, like up in Canada, they might still have some maypole ceremonies. But the first I ever saw was in Normandy, France. And I'm going through an old medieval village. I was like, oh, there, there was a maypole right there. Uh, first time I ever saw them. Then I saw quite a few of them across Europe and Austria and all over. 
The custom is medieval to the bone. Your second clue with archaeological remains that can be found in Sweden and the Nordic countries to uh, all the way down to Scotland and Britain, as far south as France, Spain, and Italy, and then in Belgium and all throughout Germany, as well as the neighboring countries which they influenced. Yes, even the Slav countries. Again, though, and I can't stress this enough, its origins are completely unknown. It appears as though we have another instance where everyone woke up one morning with a hangover and a memory loss and the nagging question, why are we still doing this? Because nobody has a straight answer, nor that can they recall. Just last week, I wrote a paper called Night Moves. And of course, I gave that presentation like five minutes ago, which covers the carol, A Lost Dance of the Dark Ages. Why beat around the bush? We all know it was the Millennial Kingdom. I bring that up because the carol, though it was known as the Rondeau in France and the Regan in Germany, was a circular uh, was a circular dance involving many players and hand holding, much like the maypole. In fact, that's what many of you may have been thinking all along: that the lost dance of the Millennial Kingdom had a connection with the maypole, albeit an awkward one. I didn't bring it up then, knowing that I'd get around to covering the subject, and here we are. Well, I'm here to tell you that in both instances, somebody cooked the books. Perhaps we can figure out what was going on. The common consensus, as I started to say, is that the maypole held an importance in Germanic paganism and that the tradition not only survived the introduction of Christianity, but that it also became influential throughout the Christianization of Europe during the Middle Ages. In fact, it flourished. And of course, this is, you know, what I would have told you just a couple of years ago, even a couple of years ago, even though I've been looking at Millennial King research for four or five years now, uh, that that trip to Europe and we were you know living there for several months. Uh, I would see these and I that would be my conclusion. Oh, that yeah, the Dark Ages, they, they were, you know, they I would call them the Dark Ages because it was like. Uh, yeah, Christianity was totally pagan, and the, the maypole is proof of that. Just more paganism it slipped through the cracks and all that kind of stuff. And of course, I've reversed my position on uh, all of that now, and I see it as the age of light rather than the dark, rather than the dark ages. The problem with this theory that I've just given you is mainly twofold. One is that there is no evidence for the maypole finding its roots before its medieval counterpart. Counterpart. There is not one instance of it ever being seen. It's, there's only conjecture of what it may may be related to, but it's conjecture. And secondly, it butts heads with my own thesis that the Middle Ages, spanning the years 500 to 1500, was the Millennial Kingdom of Yahusha Hamashiach, in which we get the beautiful Gothic uh, architecture. There's nothing else on it in history. It, it just it's it's stunning. I am of the opinion, and in fact, I'm not alone in the, this time around, that the maypole was in fact a unique creation of medieval culture, like the Gothic infrastructure which embodied it. So here we have uh, two people, um, Ronald Hutton on the left, meet Ronald Hutton, and Carl Wilhelm von Sido on the right. How bad of how badass of a name is that? Von Sido. I wish I had a name like that. That'd be awesome. At the risk of being called a purple pillar, I happen to fall in agreement with English historian Ronald Hutton and Swedish scholar, I put that in quotes there, Carl Wilhelm von Sido. Mostly, mostly. I know, right? What is happening to me? My campaign promise is not to make a habit of it, of agreeing with the scholars. Hutton is described as specializing in British folklore pre-Christian religion, and contemporary paganism, whereas Wilhelm, Wilhelm von Sido holds the title of quote-unquote folklore scholar. Wikipedia, which I clipped that um, from up there, Wikipedia has them both concurring with the other, that maypoles were erected simply as signs that the happy season of warmth and comfort had returned. Oh, I see what they did there. The maypole was erected as a sign of, of happy. Tee hee hee. They were long and pointy, which is totally suspicious, and also sometimes made of wood. Another clue. 
Then again, so are lighthouses, bell towers, javelins, and cathedral spires, all features of the Dark Ages. And of course, today we have flagpoles and, and telephone poles. Won't somebody please think about the children? Actually, we don't really have telephone poles anymore. I take the back. They're disappearing across the country. We have cell phone towers. Won't somebody please think about the children? Well, let's see what we see here. This is, uh, this is from this quote I pulled from Ronald Hutton's book called Stations of the Sun, A History of the Ritual Year in Britain. So this is like the whole subject of his book about, you know, uh, uh, paganism uh, within Britain. And he says, there is no historical basis for his claim, uh, whoever is claiming that it uh, goes back to pagan uh, kind of seasonal sex uh, ceremonies. There is no historical basis for his claim and no sign that the people who, who, who used maypoles thought that they were phallic. They were not carved to appear so. Anyhow, there is the conclusion of everyone's favorite British paganist historian, Ronald Hutton. Maypoles weren't phallic, according to him. People are free to disagree and arrive at their own worldview, though he has not found a single reason to make the connection, and you know a pagan wants to whenever they can get a crack at it. Much like a coat rack, which is also suspiciously phallic, now that I'm thinking about it, Hudson suggests their shape simply allowed for garlands to be hung from them. Well, here's two men I'm sure you recognize. It is Thomas Hobbes, who apparently claimed the maple dated back to the Roman worship of Priapus. A fresco of Priapus has survived at Pompeii, which depicts, wait for it, a sausage so enormous that he's weighing it on a balance against a bag of gold. Hard to tell, but the gold may be losing. It's not for the faint of heart. And in fact, I chose not to show it and here for the presentation as well, because I'd rather not. Well, cold cock my peeps with something so unexpectedly enormous, especially not the ladies of the group, the fair sex. But if you're reading the paper, there it is, the link. If uh, if you care, Wiki comes through for those of you who must know the truth at all cost. In short, Priapus harkens uh, back to the horse-sized schlongs of the Watchers. If you don't believe me, then you can look First Enoch or eighty-six four up for yourself, in which it describes uh, the how large the Watchers uh, yuhus were. My point is, Hobbes made an assertion. That the maypole was a worship of these of this uh, Greek god, which worshipped uh, size matters, though there appears to be no surviving breadcrumbs to show for it, assuming there were any to begin with. More dis more dis uh, misdirection. Excuse me. More dis. Hold on. I need another drink of water. More misdirection from our controllers in the propaganda department is my guess. The biggest phallus advocate of them all would be. You guessed it, Dr. Freud. For Freud, the maypole was a significant signpost to the repressed, unconscious desire, if you get my drift. Then again, there is the matter of all those cigars which Freud received an oral fixation from. A raise of hands. Anyone in class smoke a stogie now and then? You may be a subconscious homosexual with mommy issues. Or maybe a cigar is just a cigar and... A uh, maypole is just a maypole. Now that I have gotten those unpleasantries out of the way, of course, because I I know that they're going to come up in comments. Like if you don't if you don't touch on them, somebody always sees as a weakness and they move in. Like got you. You didn't you didn't look at this. You you didn't look at it from this angle. You should know that the maypole is extremely esoteric. I take that to be good news. Otherwise, we'd be observing another one of those drab bread and circus sporting events. Yes, the esoteric can be discovered in a great many religions around the world. Must be pagan then, LOL. Try not to forget that the mysteries of heaven, I already talked about Enoch tonight. Uh, try not to forget, forget that the mysteries of heaven were distributed across the earth, first through the religion of the Watchers, but also the sons of Noah had something to do with it. 
fast forward through his story and Yahushua HaMashiach is the embodiment of truth via the tabernacle mysteries first handed down to us in the Torah and then clarified in the Gospels, though he also became king of kings over the entire earth, inheriting every land and culture. Try not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Some of you might be wondering, what is the tabernacle mysteries? I actually talked about that um, last Friday night for my Torah portions. What was it? It was the last uh, portion for Exodus. And I, I want to get a whole presentation done on that, on the, the tabernacle mysteries, or what I would call the kingdom mysteries. Really some phenomenal stuff I was digging up. And tell the normies about the axis mundi, and they immediately think you're talking about the spinning, wobbling globe. No, the axis mundi is ancient and strictly geocentric referring to the axis of rotation of the celestial sphere rather than the earth. The maypole is most likely alluding to that. They were flat earthists, you know, the, the medieval times people. I just thought you should know. And what is connected to the cosmic axis but the tree of life? Like any good onion, there are ever-expanding layers to be unraveled, much as to be unpacked. Uh, skipping right over the Nazi misdirection, swastika derives from the Sanskrit word svastika, meaning beneficial to well-beings. But it goes by many names and can be found all throughout the ancient world. Most notably, the swastika directs our attention to the Big Dipper in relation with the North Star. So if you don't just you need an illustration, there you go right there. Uh, North Star and... Uh, in a 24-hour day, the Big Dipper makes a swastika around it, but you can also see the summer solstice, the spring, winter, and fall solstice all throughout the year. It makes a swastika. Better shut it down. So the swastika directs our attention to the Big Dipper in relation with the North Star, and what, pray tell, does that mean? Well, the Big Dipper makes a 360 every 24 hours, forming a swastika. But then it also happens to form one over all four yearly equinoxes, spring, summer, fall, and winter. I knew it. Even the heavens are a stronghold for white supremacy. The year is cyclical rather than linear and represents the life of man, the health of the soul, as well as the coil of cosmology with its many resets. And need I mention the Ouroboros? With the spring equinox, we are granted new life from the cold, dark death of winter. And of course, the spring equinox would begin the year. The seeds of the kingdom are planted into the souls of our infancy, encouraging us to grow. Summer is a season which basks in the, greener, in the greenery of spiritual insight as well as youth. Autumn encourages the gnosis of wisdom, by which the bridge between our Father and the heavenly and our own material plane can be understood in light of our fading youth. Whereas with winter, we come closer to letting go of the material body, entering the realm of the invisible Ruach, preparing for eternity, of course. The maypole only introduces one of those seasons, summer. The seeds of the kingdom have flourished through the photosynthesis of the Ruach. Nature is at its apex. The summer involves the crossroads of Pentecost, interestingly enough. It is there that we encounter the outpouring of the Ruach HaKadosh, the feminine divine. The masculine and the feminine reminds us of the zodiac and the twin uh, Pisces constellation. When the sun entered Pisces at the spring equinox, well, this was a very long time ago, humanity, humanity entered the age of Pisces which is precisely where the maypole dancers found themselves smack dab in the millennial kingdom of Yahushua HaMashiach. This is, of course, a review from my book, The Hidden Wilderness, wherein I make mention of Hyperborea and Eden's relation with Maru, both of which are cosmic, cosmic mountains of the Axis Mundi, the same mountain, mind you, among many other connecting points, meaning that Maru and Eden um, are the same mountain, and um, I don't want to go through all over all those details again, but uh, perhaps I shall even have to include Mystery of the Maple as a chapter in my next edition of The Hidden Wilderness because it fits right in with the rest. Like it just you take all that research that I showed and kind of just like there it is. It just it fits. It's a perfect fit. And of course, perhaps you are finally figuring out that the title is a 
uh, double ent entendre, having, having uh, two meanings. The maypole itself is a mystery in the history books, but then it also contains every hint that a mystery of heaven is involved. So yes, it's a historical mystery, but it's also a mystery of heaven. Supposing you haven't read it, The Hidden Wilderness, then you may be completely lost at my insistence to reference the moon map with the maypole. Hyperborea may have been true north thousands of years ago, specifically during the Genesis reset event, but that no longer appears to be the case. Magnetic true north is on the move. Where is it moving to? Well, in a circle around the greater realm, if I had to guess, there, there is more of that Millennial Kingdom circle dance that we talked about earlier tonight. So look right here. Uh, you can see here on this one right here. On, well, let me scroll down. This one right here on the left would be our side of the realm on the moon, the map. You could see uh, North America and the state of Florida right there. And then here uh, you could see true north. So the sun and the moon go around on the red circle. And then true north goes around on the pink circle. And as true north winds around the greater realm, the sun and the moon go around it. So the idea is in so many years, uh, we're going to see on the right here, this side of the world light up. And then below it. And then on the left. And it's going to go all the way back around again. And in fact, there's a, it appears as though the sun takes 25,800 years to make a complete carol or rondu around all 12 constellations of the zodiac see how i just tied that in well theoretically true north takes the same journey around the greater realm it goes without uh, it goes without mention that the sun and the moon dance 24 hour carols around true north uh, i mean one one circle every 24 hours that means in 12,400 years or less true north according to this theory will be on the opposite end of the greater realm. The sun and the moon will be there as well, indicating that our end of the realm will sit in total darkness. So when it, when uh, in the idea is in talk about uh, global warming and uh, global cooling, I guess uh, in about 26,000 years, well, less really 25,000 years, 24,000 years, when the sun and the moon come back around to our side of the realm, the archaeologists, you know, theoretically will be, digging up society and talking about these ancients uh, that existed. Maybe there'll be a whole new group of uh, religious, <laughs> a Bible even Christians out there like, no, -uh, the earth isn't that old. The maple, uh, the maple ceremony typically goes down on May 1st, depending a great deal on where one is positioned on the plane. The northernmost countries like Sweden or, or Norway will not participate until the summer solstice or Pentecost. And so it just goes to show that the maypole, as it is known, is not dependent upon a fixed month or date so much as when the summer season is ushered in on every corner of the known realm, as well as the greater unknown realm. So you call it the, uh, really we'll call it the summer pole or the the, the uh, summer solstice pole or the June pole or whatever. You, I mean, it doesn't have to be the maypole. Uh, I'll be talking about these, but here you can see paintings, uh, some of the earliest paintings of the Maypole. And these are, of course, not uh, – this is not medieval paintings. These are maybe even post-Renaissance. Uh, they're not that old. But this is, of course, before the advent of photography. And this is how they're depicted, like drunken revelries, just people out there drunk on their butt, uh, dancing around chaotically and by the way it, i could totally see a scenario where it it got like that uh after during the short season i could totally see that scenario until it was finally phased out um just like just might as well just go down to the bar uh and then uh but then here we see these uh, photographs some of the early earliest photographs of the maypole and we see a very different picture than the propagandists in these paintings very very different picture of what's going on so I don't know about you, but I'm detecting a contrast between century-old documentations of the Maypole and newer ones. And by new, I'm talking about the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, 120 years ago or the whereabouts. Before the quote-unquote invention of cameras, artists envision drunken revelries, whereas the advent of photography demonstrates a disciplined and ceremonious affair. As I was uh, talking about with some of those medieval paintings of the Carol, where they looked like they, it was very uh 
disciplined and prayerful and meditative and, and maybe even um, uh, used for like, a, well, the, for praises, of course, but also repenting of sins. I see a, a, probably a lot of different uses for it. Children will be children at any age, I suppose. I mean, I could show you, you know, you know, you, you you put children up to the maypole and it starts out well, but within like 10 seconds, it's chaos, right? They're running everywhere. But, you know, children will be children. Uh, but then look at the sim symbiotic relationship of the players dressed in white. White reminds us of purity of the heavenly priesthood and being clothed in the Ruach HaKadosh. I could show you a bunch of scripture verses on that. The maypole was nothing short of an attempt to illustrate the kingdom mysteries, but by way of group effort, carefully choreographed among each participant. Drunken revelries and spiritual aptitude don't mix well. And now for the tree element. I am speaking of the world tree, the tree of life, but also the moral tree, which can be seen as the life cycle of the soul, though it may also implicate the epochs of the earth. Many of you will immediately think of Christmas trees. I know that's going to come up, but we can thank Martin Luther for those post-millennial. And of course, you can go back to uh, Jeremiah as well, Yermiahu, and they talk about uh, similar incidents uh, that of, uh, of pagan worship where they would actually cut down a tree and bring it into the house and decorate it. Of course, I see no direct relationship except for the fact that they happen to be separate spaces on the Monopoly playing board, Mysteries of Heaven edition. Now, to also to point out, maypoles traditionally, you, you can go all through Europe to this day and you'll still see them there. They're there year round. This isn't something that people are cutting down trees and moving into their house or whatever. It's it, it and I, I really wonder about the cutting down of trees too. It seems like this was a more, per, they were trying to make this more permanent event. It was something that it was, uh, something people look forward to to the advent of summer all year. And as you would pass this maypole all throughout the year, you would see it and be reminded of what's coming. There are good mysteries worth landing upon, and there are bad mysteries to be avoided. I, for one, do not favor Christmas trees. I've given my reasons why in my uh, The Many Lives of Nimrod. That's a paper you can read, or there's also a presentation on that. And we'll leave it up to you to decide on the maypole. What was the purpose of the tree of life but to bring healing to the nations? Summer just so happens to be when the natural world finds itself in the best health. It should also be the aspiration of every soul to one day eat from the tree of life, thereby living eternally through all earth cycles. Well, a traditional maypole dance involves two choreographed circles moving in opposite directions. And remember when I showed you the, 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 the circle dance at a wedding where you had uh, an inner circle and an outer circle, and they're moving in two different directions uh, traditionally. And I've seen this uh, in, in real time. The pattern of dancers carry their ribbon in an over, under, over, under, over, under pattern. So you would have a, a, a partner. It could be a, a male and a female, uh, in, or you could do it in different ways. But as you're going around, you know, you just, it's always opposite. So that they're going under and then they're going over the next person. And, you know, you're going over and under and so on and so forth. If needed, they can retrace their steps in a reverse pattern and actually pull the ribbons back out. This it's, but it's very much like tetherball. Everyone can kind of imagine tetherball, right? That must be, you know, phallic as well, I guess, you know, cause it's got a ball, right? Maybe it should have two balls, I guess. I don't know. The ribbons attached to the maple remind me of our umbilical cords or likewise the silver cords of astral projection. Of course, you can see the astronauts in space with the silver cords of astral projection as well. They are our life force with our umbilical cords and a symbolic act not only connect us to heaven through the true magnetic north, but help us to ascend there by eventually merging our very life force with the tree of life. I mean, that's the whole idea of the maypole is that you're taking all these cords or these ribbons. And as you go over, under, over, under, they all wrap together. And it, it looks like the end of a tetherball game, sort of. Look, I'm not telling you to participate in a maypole ceremony. I'm really not. I mean, this is, you're, you're an adult. We can all have this conversation. You are perfectly capable of looking at the facts for yourself and coming to your own conclusion. It would behoove me to play the part of Balaam and trick you into participating in a pagan fertility cer ceremony, thereby transgressing the Torah, choosing the curse. Don't do that. 
I'm not telling anyone to transgress anything. I'm not telling you to take part in any such ritual. All I know is official history doesn't add up. By all appearances, the Maypole was invented during the Middle Ages. And what was the Middle Ages again but the Millennial Kingdom? Expect shades of paganism from the propagandists and the cleanup crew. I mean, the fact that it's been like so scrubbed, it just that that should be a huge red flag for us. Like, what's going on here? Like, with all the other research we're looking at, every single history book that I can lay my hands upon insists that the inhabitants of the Dark Ages were mostly uneducated, a filthy, diseased people, and above all else, illiterate. That's Orwellian talk, and I don't believe a word of it. Even if it were true, though, and the Millennial Kingdom failed to happen, as I proposed that it did, then even according to the official narrative, the inhabitants of the Middle Ages come across like the most spiritually literate people in his story. I mean, they really do. They were, a, even if the, what I'm saying is, even if the Dark Ages were true, and they are some of the, from, Everything I've been reading and looking into, and I have some exciting stuff I want to show in the coming weeks. These people were the most spiritually literate and advanced people. Far, you know, forget the Hollywood propaganda. Contrarily, it is the people today with our supposed wealth of knowledge, you know, the internet and all of our access to information, who have inherited very few of any spiritual role models. Try to think of any sp uh, spiritual role models out there in the mainstream media. Try. Our religious heritage is nearly all but vanquished, and wisdom is hard to come by. We are surrounded by a sick and spiritually illiterate people. For all our knowledge of reading, right? What good does it do us? Con and we're conditioned to accept malpractice. How tragic. Nearly everything that I can find regarding medieval culture elevates an unprecedented obsession with the pilgrimage. I will surely have uh, more to say on that. I, in fact, I just published uh, my paper today on uh, the pilgrimage, and I'm so excited to read that to you guys. And um, I'll, I'll probably do that next week, so stay tuned. The pilgrimage to where? A around the Maypole? Jerusalem, Jerusalem is what nearly every history book offers and would be the shallow exoteric answer. The physical illiterates, as they're advertised, were in fact spiritual literates, esoteric to the core. And above all else, it is new Yerushalayim, which they long for. So, uh, yeah, there it is. That's going to end it there. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And uh, I'll have uh, more next week. And um, just remind everybody, I got my, I have my Paul study, my, the, the, uh, the Torah abides Paul's letters to the Galatians according to the law of Yah. And uh, I move that. I'm going to be doing that Friday night after my Torah portions. I'll be doing that. And then next week I expect to have more uh, stolen history, millennial kingdom talk. Love you guys. Have a good week. I'll be around on discord all week. Come and say hi, speak to me and um, yeah, we'll do this again.